chunk is now moved because there's nothing I can do with it except store it. And at the same time, I restart this formula. And now this time I say go left, and I'll go left again, and now I'm finished. Okay? And, you know, the steering got me to ignore C. Okay, that's the clever proof, of course, right? So it's not a constant size, but it's a very small one. So the point here is, if I have a clever proof, and I use the non-invertible rules, that's exactly the time I can insert my clever ideas, if you will. So those are sort of two extremes. There's the one where the proof-making process doesn't listen to you at all, and the, the other one, in this case, where it listens to you a lot, every time it has to go left to right. Okay, uh, just to show an example of how we can continue with this, uh, these two extremes can actually be shoved together into one system. And this would be an example of a focus proof system <coughs> for uh, a flexible fo focusing proof system. I'll give an example in the next slide. So for this to work, I'm going to put two copies of every propositional connective, the trues, the false, the ors, disjunction and conjunction, will now have a negative version and a positive version. The truth is semantically the same. The role and proof are different. Okay? We're not interested in truth per se here, but in proof. Because if I can have a, a proof that's exponential versus a proof that's sort of linear or constant, that's a huge difference and I'm going to care about that. And whether I put pluses or minuses will give me a difference between this huge and small choice. So it, in this sense, it's extremely important. Um, the rule, uh, in particular, the rules for the negative connectives are invertible. That'll be an invariant for what we see. Uh, these polarized connectives do separate if you move into linear logic. Okay? They're, they're known from linear logic. They behave differently in that setting. But in the classical setting, they turn out to be truth functionally the same. There's only one. The two conjunctions are truth functionally the same. Uh, yes, so uh, in this setting, in a classical setting, the role of intuitionistic logic, uh, the role of uh, the implication seems silly. Okay, all right. But uh, a good thing is to say there's the same kind of proof system works very well in outward uh, connections, very well in intuitionistic logic. In fact, the, the classical one I'll show can be hosted on top of the intuitionistic one. So, it's, so that's the only one you really need to implement. And there, yeah, implication is uh, critical and two-sided is convenient. Yeah, so this works very well in the intuitionistic setting. And I'm going to have uh, two kinds of sequence. Before I had semicolons with two different zones in one and three different zones in another, there is a sen certain sense I only need the two zones separated by an up arrow and a down arrow. Okay, this is still a one-sided sequence system. It's just that there are two zones on the, white, on the right hand side. And when I have the up arrow, it's for the invertible or negative phase. So now I have three words for the same thing. Up, invertible, and asynchronous. Uh, no, up, invertible, negative, and clerk. Four words for the same thing. Okay? And I have four words for the, the opposite. Uh, positive, invertible, down, and expert. Sorry for all that. There's actually even more words in the literature. And I'll just show you the proof system. This is the proof system I have in mind there. Um, see, up here I have all these are up arrow sequence. Everything there is an up arrow. And all those rules are invertible. Here is the other rules, the positive ones. And you see here's the critical non-invertible one. There's a reason why this is also non-invertible, but you can't see it now because there's something missing. But if I add to something more, which is parallelism in proof, you can see it. So there's a reason why I, I'd like to say all these are invertible, but that clearly looks, no, sorry. Sorry, I confused you. This uh, is, looks invertible, but there's something missing. If I put the something in, you'd see that it's not invertible. Okay, but that's another talk. This is a critical one. Notice the, the positive or is the one where I, I throw away a, a possibility. The negative or, 
I keep both possibilities. This is invertible, this is non-invertible. And then I have these other rules, and you see I've, I've used these words before in the office uh, analogy. Um, if, I'm in the down, if I'm in this phase and I have a formula that the clerk no longer, uh, when the clerk looks at it and goes, oh, this is something for the expert, he'll file it to give to an expert later, okay? So that's storing, and that you store it into a filing cabinet here. Uh, if the expert is working on something which is negative, that means, ah, I shouldn't do this. That's below my pay grade. I give it to the clerk. Okay, there's just a computation to do. Okay, so it goes to the clerk. All right, uh, then when the clerk uh, cleans off his desk, all the things that have been piled on his desk, he was working, does his calculations, files things away, his desk is empty. He then goes to the expert so she can pick something from the filing cabinet to work on. So that's, uh, the clerk now does a decide on what to do next, okay? You put all this together and you get a very nice proof system, this one. And, uh, all right, so, and whenever I see P as a positive formula, I mean the top level connective is positive. We only look into the top level. You can have lots of negative things underneath, it's fine. Just the top level connective is all that's important. All right, now, what can I say about that proof system? Uh, and this works easily, very easily in, uh, in first order logic as well, first order variation. If I take a propositional formula in uh, classical logic, and I let b hat be the result of adding pluses and minuses to the propositional connectives. If I have n occurrences of propositional connectives, I have two to the n possible hats I could choose, okay? So it's a lot of polarization possibilities. All right, uh, then the theorem is this. If, that is a, if you start with a tautology, then every polarization has an LKF proof. So it has nothing to do with provability, this polarization, but it has everything to do with proof. Some of those proofs can be huge, some of them can be small. All right, and it depends a lot on the polarity you choose. And if some polarization has a, an LKF proof, LK, sorry, the previous proof system it was called LKF for focused L Genson's LK. Then if I can prove it for any one of the polarization, then it then the original B is a topology, and hence every polarization is provable if one is provable. Okay, so a strong uh, completeness result there. So like I say, it has nothing this doesn't really have much to do with provability, but about proof. And I should also comment that negative formulas are treated linearly in the sense of linear logic. They're, a linear formula, non-atomic non linear formula, is never weakened, never contracted. This is the only contraction rule. It happens, the only place where you can do contraction, and it has to be a positive formula to contract. And the only time you weaken something is uh, here. Okay, and if you follow this through, you don't get negative formulas in that zone. So linear logic is sort of behind uh, some of the refinements here. All right. Now, let's do a, an actual example. What do I mean by the atoms of inference, molecules, and focusing? So let's do an example. I have theta contains this formula, A and B and not C. Okay, and then I'm using the positive and here. So that, uh, we're going to assume that that's inside this set theta. Now, look at this sequence. I have an up barrel dot. So the clerk's desk is empty. The expert now says, I'm going to work on that formula, A and B and not C. Okay? So now that sits on the expert's desk. Now, what happens? You have to make three. It's, an, it's uh, a conjunction of three things. So you have to prove three things, this one, this one, and this one. Uh, what you prove over here is the A. A will be a positive formula in this presentation. Okay, uh, so let's just assume propositional letters themselves are positive. Negated propositional letters would then for be negative. Okay. And if you remember carefully the rule, when I get to an atomic formula there, and I didn't stress it enough maybe, the initial rule here is when I get to an atomic formula, its complement must be present, okay? If I get a negative formula here, I don't even look if its complement is present. 
I would do this rule instead. All right? I don't look. But when I get to a positive atom here, I look. And it has to be there. And if it's not there, I must throw away that proof attempt and back up to something else. Okay. So what that says is, if I have a proof in which uh, the expert decided on this, then I must have this be proved, which means the not A must be present here. Similarly, if for proving this B, the not B must be present there. Okay. Now, what does this mean? Well, I'm doing it. The expert sees as not C, and it goes up. Oh, that's a negative formula. It's not my duty. I hand it over to the clerk. The clerk will look at it, uh, store it right away, and it gets stored over here. Okay, so what have we achieved? We have lots of little rules to build this inference rule. Okay, the clerk's desk is empty, goes back to the clerk's desk being empty, but the filing cabinet now has gotten a little bigger. It had in not A, not B, and now it has those two plus not C. Okay, so this is a, a, this is a higher level rule, if you will. If these two things are present, add that. And that's the implementation of the high level rule. That's the, let's say, high level inference rule. That's the low level assembly code of it. Okay? That's the spirit of it. So we go from the up arrow dot to the up arrow dot as a macro rule. That's the molecule. Those are the atoms it's composed of. Now let's just give another example of resolution. Resolution, I, I'll, I'll assume that you know it. I'll just go over it very quickly. Uh, I'm assuming we have universally quantified disjunctions of literals. The, the definition for resolvent is essentially the standard one. C3 is a resolvent of C1 and C2 if, okay, you strip off the quantifiers, you put on, you look for most general uh, um, uh, complementary literals, most general unifiers, you put everything back together. The standard definition. A consequence of that is if C3 is a resolvent of C1 and 2, then this focused sequence has a shallow proof. You only have to decide on two formulas, one, two, and then you're finished. Now, I don't know exactly how many inference rules there will be because I don't know how big the, the clauses are. They could be two literals wide or a thousand literals wide, but it's shallow in this sense, okay? So uh, I know that I can bound the search size of that easily. So that's a consequence. How would I build a, a system that would check resolution? So if someone says, here's a sequence of numbered clauses, and then you start giving re a justification. So this new clause comes from resolving those two. This new clause from these two, these, and so on, until you get to finally false at the bottom. That becomes a sequence of cuts. You start off saying, okay, uh, I want to show that uh, the, these n clauses resolve uh, to false. So that's how you would write it on, a, on the right, okay? Now, uh, someone told me that I've resolved cl uh, clause 1 and clause 2 to get clause n plus 1, all right? So how do I check that? I don't want to believe they could have done it wrong, okay? So I put here the proof that this and this implies that, basically, OK? Now, I have a choice. I could ask the person who produced the resolution proof to also produce this proof. OK, I could ask for that. The guy is likely to say, I don't, talk, don't talk to me. No one else has ever asked me for that, right? Uh, but I still don't want to trust him, so what do I do? I just put a logic, uh, let's say, a hole in the proof and ask for my system to, to search for any proof of depth 2. If I find one, I'm done. And finding a proof of depth 2 in, th in this style system is rather simple. And it's really just redoing the steps to validate that it, uh, I mean, the work it's doing is actually resolving everything, finding complementary pairs, constructing a general unifier. Okay. So then what you do is you use cut now to introduce that new clause, and I've gone from here to here, where this one new resolvent has now been added, and I can proceed. That, that's a five, yes. Thank you. All right. OK, so we actually do this, uh, this example, where we leave a hole here for the, our prover, our implementation to um, rebuild it. OK, uh, sorry. 
So just wrapping up, I have a few slides to talk about uh, what's going on. So there is a project, a multi-year project called ProofCert. It's a goal to, to find proof evidence in a very broad and general, flexible way. Uh, so we have this thing called FPC, Foundational Proof Certificate Framework. Uh, we've defined it and we're now experimenting for first order classical and intuitionistic logics for both. Okay, intuitionistic logic is some of our better examples. We have formal definitions for many things, including resolution, expansion trees, that's sort of uh, Herbron style uh, proof evidence, matings, conjunctive normal forms. In intuitionistic logic, we have a variety of objects. We have other simple things that are sort of pre, I mean, they're not, they're so weak that it's not really classical or intuitionistic. So rewriting systems or Frege proofs can be done this way. We have an implementation of all that, uh, of a system that will do the checking for us based on Lambda Prolog, in particular the Tejas uh, implementation of it. So it's there to do proof reconstruction. Logic programming, backtracking, unification search works really well in this system, okay, for, at least in our prototype efforts. And it's an interesting observation that if you implement the intuitionistic proof system, which I didn't show, but if you did, read the paper and implement it, the classical one fits right on it immediately. We're not using double negation translations or anything. It's a very elegant and immediate fit.